Help us, O God, for we are lost without you. That's how I began my sermon on this same gospel lesson 21 years ago on Sunday, September 16th, 2001. And I don't remember, I don't remember anything else I said that day. But I do remember that tears were streaming down my cheeks. Um, and then those, there were also tears streaming down the faces of the people sitting in the pews at St. James Lutheran Church in downtown Portland. As we all know, just five days before that, our whole world had been rocked by the terrorist attacks that toppled the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center, punched a gaping hole in the Pentagon, and caused a plane to go down in a field in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. The days that followed were a time of eerie silence. Do you remember that? As we all searched the clear blue sky in vain. Searching for airplanes that had all been grounded. It was also a time of raw emotion. It was a time when we all hugged our kids a little tighter. And I think we were all a little kinder to each other. In the days following the attacks, I remember walking across the park blocks to the neighborhood Starbucks and noticing that strangers would make eye contact and would ask with genuine concern, how are you today? And they actually meant it and they took time to listen to what you had to say when you answered. For a little while, the veil between us was lifted and we were able to be real with each other. Did others notice that too? Show your hands if you noticed that, too. Yeah, yeah. But sadly, it didn't last very long, did it? I mean, within a few weeks, it seems that we began to grow kind of numb from watching the constant replays of the horrific images. And we also got used to the new normal of extra security in public places. And we grew weary of the political finger pointing and the saber rattling of our leaders in Washington, D.C. In a way, it was kind of a relief to get back to the routine of life. And yet at the same time, I noticed something that still fills me with an incredible sadness. As we got used to the new normal of life in post 9-11 America, many of us put our masks back on and the walls between us went back up again. Yet even as many people were hardening their hearts in steely resolve, our God was busy. Our God was busy looking for hearts that were open and ready to receive the healing and joy that comes from the Holy Spirit. And of course, God did find some open hearts. And one of the hearts God found in the days after 9-11 belongs to a beautiful child of God by the name of Sue Casey. I first met Sue in 2003 when I was serving as the interim or transition pastor at King of Kings Lutheran Church in Milwaukee. But I didn't really realize how remarkable Sue was until much later. Um, So Sue told me as the story of how in the days immediately following 9-11, she felt called to do something, something that would bring healing. But she wasn't sure what that might be. So one on... One evening on September 26, 2001, while leaving a Taze service at Central Lutheran Church in Northeast Portland, she was asking God to give her some guidance. And she prayed silently, God, you're going to have to guide me on this one. I don't have a clue as to how I could help. As she was locking, unlocking the door to her car, she happened to look up and she saw a beautiful yellow rose. And immediately the thought popped into her head. Rose garden. I'll create a rose garden. And as she was sitting in her car thinking about this, the the words, remember me, came to her. By the time she pulled into her driveway, she knew that the rose garden had its name. Remember me, rose garden. Well, back in 2003, when Sue told me about her vision, I remember thinking, wow, creating a rose garden at an East Coast crash site is an ambitious undertaking 
for someone from the West Coast. Um, and I'll, then after I left King of Kings in August of 2004, I kind of I lost contact with Sue. But whenever the anniversary of 9-11 rolls around, I think of her and I wonder, whatever happened with Remember Me Rose Garden? And I've Googled it a couple times um, over the years just to see. And several years ago, I was delighted to find that there is, in fact, a Remember Me Rose Garden um, on donated land near the memorial site in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. And recently, I've seen updates on Facebook about work that's currently being done to improve and maintain the memorial. I've also found a 2004 Washington Post story that helped fill in some of the missing pieces for me. Near the end of the article, journalist Joel M. Lerner writes, quote, Although Remember Me Rose Garden has a lot of support and anticipates more, in some ways this has been a solo effort. Almost all the money spent so far has been Casey's. She's used credit cards, retirement funds, a home refinance, tax refunds, frequent flyer miles, and overtime pay, but she claims little credit. She, um, and, and then he quotes Sue Casey saying, to me, this wasn't my idea. This was a gift that was entrusted to me to bring to fruition. Now, I have to confess that when I read about Sue's financial sacrifice, she was um, a receptionist at a law firm, so not didn't make a huge amount of money. I got a little bit judgy when I read that. I was like, whoa, that's risky. <laughs> Some might even say that's foolish for Sue to put down put her own finances on the line like that. But then I thought, well, duh, that's what happens when the Holy Spirit gets a hold of your heart, right? I mean, you become a fool for Christ and you give it all away because it's not yours anyway. It's a gift from God, everything we have. You give it away in the name of love and you give it away with joy and with wild abandon. And it's taken many years and many hearts and hands, but the vision God planted in Sue's heart has taken root. Remember Me Rose Garden continues to blossom into a place of beauty and healing and even joy for the families of those who lost their loved ones in the crash and for all who visit that somber site. Well, of course, the story of Sue Casey and Remember Me Rose Garden is only one of many stories of God working in and through ordinary people to bring extraordinary healing and resurrection joy in the wake of an unfathomable tsunami of death. As we know, on that fateful day 21 years ago, there were a number of courageous individuals who risked their lives to help guide people out of the towers before they collapsed. One was um, a man named Wells Crowther. He was an equities trader in the World Trade Center. After the second tower was hit, Wells led everyone he could find down the steps to safety, and then, he went back for more. And after leading more people to safety, he went back again and again and again until the tower collapsed. Lutheran scholar David Lowe sums up Wells' story. He says, quote, On that day, this talented, athletic, good-natured, but in so many ways ordinary person did an extraordinary thing, giving his life to make sure others would live. On that day, God used Wells Crowther to find people who were lost. Some of us also recall the heartwarming story about the gracious citizens of Gander, Newfoundland, who opened their hearts and their doors to provide food and shelter to 7,000 lost and weary travelers who became stranded when the United States closed its airspace. Again, God found hearts open to God's call, and those good-hearted people brought so much healing and joy that the grateful travelers later felt moved to repay kindness with kindness. Indeed, their joy overflowed with generous donations to a scholarship fund for the children of Gander. And that, my friends, is a little glimpse, I think, of the kingdom of God. You see, our God loves all God's children and wants everyone to come to the party, to experience the joy of loving God and loving our neighbor, 
To say it another way, our gracious and merciful God doesn't want anyone to be lost or left out in the cold. And so like the shepherd who leaves the 99 sheep to go looking for the one lost sheep, or like the woman who sets her nine coins aside and spends all night sweeping the house to find the one lost coin, our God will never stop looking for any of God's children who are lost. As part of my sermon prep this week, I listened to a preaching podcast from Luther Seminary. And one of the profs on the, on the podcast, um, Dr. Joy J. Moore, she told the story that made me sit up and take notice. She said earlier this summer she was driving in Pennsylvania when she got lost. Imagine that. And she soon realized she was on the Memorial Highway for the people who died on Flight 93. Because she had made a wrong turn, she saw the exit for the National Memorial and spontaneously decided to visit. Now, while she didn't specifically mention Remember Me Rose Garden, which is only a quarter mile from the entrance to the Memorial Park, Dr. Moore did speak about how she'd expected to gather with others in a place of remembering and mourning, grieving, but instead had been surprised to find herself experiencing a deep sense of joy. She said that for her, the joy came while listening to the wind chimes of the 93 foot tall Tower of Voices. As she reflected on the sacrifice of the 40 people who deliberately crashed the plane and sacrificed their lives in order to prevent the loss of many more lives. The professor said that she was quite moved by the fact that it was a wind from God that created the beautiful sound of the chimes, and that just filled her heart with peace and joy. And then she connected her experience with the life of Christ church, saying, and that's what we gather together for in the church, right? We gather to remember that in the midst of our grief, God is still breathing God's spirit on us. That's the rejoicing in heaven. Now, Dr. Moore's um, observation is spot on, but I want to just nuance her wording a, a little bit to emphasize that God is the one who gathers us in. Whereas you and I might think, that we're the ones who voluntarily drove ourselves to worship this morning, it's actually the Holy Spirit who found us and put it on our hearts to come here. Right? The Spirit drew us here today. As our Lutheran confessions say, that the Holy Spirit works faith when and where it pleases God. So today, you and I have been gathered here by God in order that we may be nourished and renewed through word and sacrament and through the love embodied in this community. I want to let that sink in for just a moment. God has gathered you and me here today together. And that in itself is cause for great joy. However, the parable Jesus tells in today's gospel reading makes it abundantly clear that God's joy won't be complete until all God's lost children have been gathered into God's family. Take a look at Luke chapter 15, and you'll see that the verb to find or to be found is used eight times. I don't think I need to tell you that the one doing the finding is always God. So taking this to the next logical step, I think you and I can see that sheep and coins don't really have any agency in repenting, do they? They don't know how to repent. Mm -mm. So repentance then is the result of being acted upon by God. Repentance is this, it's the same uh, thing as with holy baptism and holy communion. It's not what you and I do. It's what God does that matters. 
We can't do anything to earn God's grace. So if we look at things in this way, repentance isn't primarily about moral correction. It's about being found. Repentance is about being found and brought back by our persistently gracious God who gathers us in and then opens our eyes so that we can begin to see where each of us fits in God's grand design. And there's a place for each and every one of us. Oh, and one more thing. Remember I said a minute ago that God's joy won't be complete until all God's children have been gathered in? Well, believe it or not, the same is true for you and me. Our joy won't be complete. It can't be complete either until all of our lost siblings are gathered in. And, and it can't be complete until we all stop grumbling like those scribes and Pharisees were doing, right? We need to stop grumbling about each other. And we need to take our places as equals at Christ's table of Shalom, where there's always more than enough grace to go around, and even the crumbs are a foretaste of the feast to come. Thanks be to God. Amen.